Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gorowski, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been tuning in this month, you know it is one of our favorite months every school year. We kick all the men out for the month, and we host women in science and exploration, adventure, and conservation. So we're just past the midway point. We still have tons of amazing events uh, coming up to tune into. Uh, so if you head to exploringbytheseat.com, you can find everything that's coming up and how you can tune in and join us. So we're rolling right along today with one of my favorite uh, explorers to hang out with. We are going to spend a little time with Anusha Shankar. We're going to take a dive into the highly energetic world of the hummingbird. So Anusha is a National Geographic explorer uh, and young leader. She's a Lewis and Clark field scholar and a recent PhD graduate from the Graham Lab at Stony Brook University in New York. So she's really interested in how animals manage their energetic needs. So what they need uh, throughout the day uh, to survive. So she's worked in a number of field sites through Arizona and Ecuador, and she's currently a Rose postdoctoral fellow studying hummingbirds at the Lab of Ornithology at Cornell University. So I'm gonna bring Anusha in with us. Hey Anusha, how are you? Hi Joe, I'm doing really well. How are you? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Well, it's great to see you as always. We just stole you last weekend for the Women Blaze Trails Festival. So thank you uh, for joining that. And thank you for hanging out with our classrooms today. It's my pleasure. All right, good stuff. Well, I am gonna let you take over for a little bit. Uh, I am gonna give a shout out though. I can see we've got groups tuning in via YouTube. Use that chat bar to let us know where you're tuning in from uh, and then pop in a few questions. Um, okay, that's enough for me. Anusha, it's all you for a little bit. Thank you. I will start by sharing my screen as everyone seems to do nowadays. Mm, let's do this one. All right, and let me start my presentation. So you should be able to see some subtitles um, and so if you have difficulty hearing me, hopefully that'll help. I am so excited to talk to you all about hummingbirds today. I've been studying them for about nine years now, uh, so quite a while. But first I'll start with telling you a little bit about where I came from and what excites me about studying um, ecology and wildlife and animals. I grew up, I spent a lot of my childhood in India, in the Southeast, in a city called Chennai. Uh, this is me when I was really young, uh, um, playing with a camera case. And this is me with my family. Uh, I love dancing. As you can see on the left, this, this passion has continued with time and changed from Indian dances to more um, South American and Latin dances like salsa and bachata. And this is me on the right uh, with my family being happy being outside. I just want to take a minute for us to appreciate how much amazing, wonderful biodiversity there is in the world. So there's so many different species of animals and plants and insects and all kinds of things that exist on the planet today. Um, like there's these giant giraffes. They have the same number of bones in their necks that we do. They have seven vertebrae as they're called in their necks and so do we, but they're so long, right? Um, there's also giant blue whales, which are also mammals like us that live in the ocean. There's ostriches that are flight birds, that, but they can't fly. There's ants and insects and all kinds of life living on the earth today. And we share this planet with them. They live in the same places that we do. And this just blows my mind when I think about it. Um, there's also king cobras in the world, which I had the fortune of studying. I was um, working on this project for a few weeks once when we were tracking these king cobras and seeing what kind of uh, parts of the habitat they use. So these ones live in a very agricultural kind of landscape in India. And I was seeing, um, I was on this project where they were looking at what kind of, how much time they spent in different landscapes like this. Um, uh, but while I was studying those king cobras, I also took a lot of photos of other animals. And there was so much um, that I saw that was a living, just alive in these uh, Western Ghats, which are hills in Southern India on, this, on the West Coast. There's these incredible butterflies. Um, let me just get this pointer up. So there's these incredible butterflies and bugs and spiders and other snakes, ants. There's just so much interesting 
life if, we're paying, if we pay attention to it. I also got the chance to go to Assam, which is in the northeast of India, and uh, work at this rehabilitation center for a while where they had this orphan baby little bear um, and we had to feed it and take care of it because it, its mom had been killed. Um, and this gibbon, um, whose mom had also been killed by poaching. So there's a lot of pressures that are facing wildlife today. We, um, we're, we're sharing the planet with these, with these animals, but we're also up against them all the time as humans. Uh, and there's a lot of conflict in that. I also got to study uh, a bird that's similar to toucans. Um, if you've ever seen a toucan, write that in the chat and we'll, we'll talk about them after. But these are uh, birds in South America that have big beaks and are really big birds. And very similar to them in Asia and Africa, there are hornbills. Um, and these hornbills also have big beaks, which are slightly differently shaped. And I got to study these hornbills in South India. And I got to study how they choose a nest site um, because they nest in these big holes in trees called tree cavities. And they have their babies. Um, they lay the, the mom lays the, her eggs in there and then raises the babies. And she doesn't leave that tree cavity or that nest for th up to three months um, while she's taking care of her babies. And the male um, who, who she's mated with comes and gives them food through a little hole in the tree cavity. So I was studying those hornbills in India as well. And again, while I was studying those hornbills, I would take photos of all the insects and, and other animals that I could find, like this map butterfly and this bug laying eggs and this purple sunbird, um, which is a really tiny bird that's very similar to hummingbirds, but in Africa and Asia and some other bugs as well. Um, so eventually I made my way to the US to do my PhD and I was at Stony Brook uh, in New York, but I did a lot of field work in Arizona and in Ecuador, like, like Joe just mentioned. Um, so Ecuador is this, there's this pretty tiny country in South America, but it has a lot of different hummingbirds. So this is what they look like in Ecuador. Um, and this is two, two, uh, hummingbirds of different species or different types feeding from a feeder. This is the smallest hummingbird. And this always amazes me how tiny it is. Um, if, if we looked at how big this hummingbird, this is a bee hummingbird and it's only found uh, in Cuba and it weighs about 1.5 to 2 grams. Now, if that doesn't mean much to you, that's uh, to compare the, the Canadian dime or 10 cent coin is about 1.75 grams. If you're from India, that the 10 paise coin from a few years ago is 2 grams. And um, hmm, I don't know why this image is kind of weird. That's the American dime, and that weighs 2.5 grams. So this bee hummingbird weighs less than the American dime. And it weighs a little about the same as the Canadian and Indian uh, coins that you see here. So hummingbirds use energy really, really quickly. They fi fly super, super fast and they're very, very small and they're using up energy so fast. Um, and they feed mostly on sugar water or nectar from plants or from feeders like you can see here. They also feed on insects, especially when um, mommy hummingbirds have to feed their babies and get, give them a lot of protein. Insects are a good protein source. Um, so if you have the metabolic rate or the energy needs of a hummingbird, if you're using up energy as fast as hummingbirds did, uh, as an adult human, you would have to eat about 300 hamburgers a day to survive. That's how much energy they need to fuel their life. And somehow, even though they're so small and they use up energy so fast, they're able to live in all kinds of different places, like in the cloud forests in Ecuador, which are a type of rainforest, the deserts in Arizona, the high elevation mountains in the Andes in Ecuador and South America in general, in Peru and um, uh, in Colombia. And um, they're just able to live in so many places all across North and South America, even though they have such specific needs. And somehow there's over 330 different types of species of them. They've uh, evolved and uh, it's called diversified. So there's many different species that have come to come to life um, from this giant hummingbird, which is about nine times the size of this bee hummingbird that we saw earlier. This sword-billed hummingbird, who has, which has a bill that's or a beak that's longer than its body, that's the only bird to do to have that. This very colorful crimson topaz, and one of my favorites, which is the booted racket tail. 
Um, this male you can see has this long tail and uh, these little white boots on his legs. So there's just a, an incredible diversity or type number of species of hummingbirds in the world. And like I said, they get their nectar mostly from sugar water from plants uh, or nectar. And that makes them really important pollinators because they take the pollen from one flower and put it in another flower and help that, that plant reproduce and have babies. So they don't just exist by themselves, they're also helping with the reproduction of plants. So I was really interested in how they use energy. And if I wanted to do that for a human, I could just ask you to put a Fitbit on. Um, how many of you track your time with Fitbits or have parents that track their time with Fitbits? Show of hands maybe, or write it in the chat. Um, so that's one way to gauge or assess how much activity you have in a day and how much energy you're using in a day. But we can't really do that for hummingbirds because there are no Fitbits that are small enough to fit on a hummingbird, unfortunately. So we have to find other ways of studying them. And one way is uh, to catch them using these feeder traps. So uh, there's a feeder in the middle and the hummingbird comes into this trap and we drop the trap down and we gently go and take the hummingbird out. You have to go through a lot of training and get a lot of um, permissions from the US wildlife departments to be able to do this. So you can't just go and catch a hummingbird, but once we do, they look something like this. And one of the things that I was most fascinated to study about them was what they do at night because they're using energy so fast during the day and they don't feed at night. They're not able to eat in the night because they can't see it's too dark. Um, and very often their flowers are not producing nectar at night. So how do they make it through the night? Um, because during the day, if they don't eat for a couple of hours, they could die. They, they, they use up their energy that quickly. So at night, they use a strategy called torpor, T-O-R-P-O-R. And this is a photo of someone on the internet posted uh, of a hummingbird in torpor. And we can study them by uh, in torpor at night using these thermal cameras. So torpor is basically uh, a state when they lower their body temperature, they get really cold. And with that, they can lower the amount of energy they need. So the warmer that you are, the more energy you need to keep up that body temperature and uh, use it. all your enzymes have to work at a higher speed. Uh, whereas if you cool down, every, your body kind of slows down. And so they're able to do that to save energy at night. So as the night gets colder, they get colder and they're saving energy by doing that. And um, so we point these thermal cameras at these tiny little hummingbirds and we get images and videos that look like this. So this is an image of a hummingbird peeing, which is one of my favorite hummingbird activities. Um, and this is a video of a hummingbird that is asleep. So its body is, at, is really warm. Uh, the warmer colors are warmer temperatures. This is the hummingbird's eye over here in red. This is its beak. This is its tail. And these are its feathers. You can see that are kind of puffed up and keeping it warm. And its heart is beating fast and it's breathing really quickly. And this is the same hummingbird um, in torpor. So its whole body has gotten cold, right? It's the same temperature as the outside air. It's not generating heat and it's almost not breathing. This doesn't look like a video, but it is a video. It's not, it's almost not breathing. It's breathing very, very few times in a minute. Um, and its heart is beating really slow and its whole body is getting cold to save energy. This uh, is, uh, there's some other funny things that hummingbirds do at night. This is a hummingbird that's preening or kind of arranging its feathers, even though it's asleep, its eyes are closed. And this was in the middle of the night at like 2 a.m. Uh, so I like to imagine that they're dreaming, but we don't have, we don't have ways of testing that yet. Um, and a hummingbird at night, before it goes to sleep, this one peed. This is just a video on loop. Um, it's not peeing again and again, but I love watching hummingbirds pee. It's pretty funny. Um, this this is some other things that we could study with hummingbirds and torpor were hum nesting female hummingbirds. So in, in hummingbirds, just the female takes care of the babies and the eggs. And this female has laid eggs in her nest. And we were really curious to see whether female hummingbirds use torpor because they have to keep their babies warm at night, right? And if they get cold and their eggs get cold and their babies get cold and their babies can't always uh, for a long time make their own heat. So they need mom to come to keep them warm. Otherwise, their growing kind of slows down, their development slows down, and there could be problems um, developing correctly. 
So mom, we wanted to know whether mom, mom hummingbirds um, cool down and or use torpor or whether they stay warm so that their babies stay warm. Um, and we found that they stay warm. They don't use torpor so that their babies can and their eggs can stay warm. So this is a mom hummingbird feeding uh, a baby in the nest. Those are some of the things that we were able to study using hummingbirds. And I think one of the takeaways is that there's so much life out there that we can study. Um, and there's so many things to pay attention to if we spend the time to pay attention to them. So some of the things you can consider doing in your own lives are to go outside for one or two hours a week, maybe just a 15, 20 minute walk every day or every few days or play outside um, and identify living things. This is an easy thing that you can do to kind of pay attention to what's out there. Um, there's a few apps now like Google Lens and iNaturalist that can help you identify what plant you see or what insect you saw or what bird you saw. Um, you can also contribute to protecting the rainforest. So there's a youth led initiative by people your age um, where you can help save rainforest in Ecuador at the moment and maybe in other places in the future. So you can go to Reserva Youth Land Trust's website and learn about how you can contribute to that initiative. There are so many citizen science projects, which I know many of your teachers already know about, um, like eBird, where you can uh, go and count birds on your on your daily walks or your weekly walks and, and write a checklist of how many species you saw and which species you saw. There's other citizen science projects, which you can do from home without even going outside, but still that are nature related. Um, like you can count penguins or watch out for pollinators and record them when you see them. Um, these are just picked satellite images of, of penguin colonies and you can identify wh where the penguins are and where the nests are to help out scientists. You can also trace bird beaks because there are scientists that have imaged bird heads and they want to know beak shapes and they need your help to be able to do that. Um, you can record any living thing that you see on when you go outside on iNaturalist. Um, and there's a compilation of great citizen science projects on this National Geographic website. Teachers can always contact me if they need more ideas for things like this. Um, this is how you can reach me if you have more questions in the future and I'll take questions. This is a giant hummingbird that's flying really, <laughs> they're so strange compared to other hummingbirds. Um, but yeah, I'll take questions. Thank you. All right. Very cool, Nusha. Thank you so much for sharing that with us today. I, um, you know, for one, love hummingbirds. We put a feeder in our backyard for the first time this summer. We ended up having a few different ones that would come and visit, which was which was really cool. The kids loved it. And that's what the first question that that came up here. We've got Miss Lumley tuning in, and she says that her feeder in her backyard, uh, one bird won't let the other ones drink. Is that normal? Yeah. So it depends on the species. Hummingbirds usually we think of them as small and cuddly and cute but uh, they can be really aggressive to each other and that's pa that's part of partly because of their lifestyle they need energy to live and so some species uh, are, can be very territorial and some individuals can be very territorial um, but we we shouldn't feel bad about that that's that's part of how nature goes right we've seen those videos of lions hunting deer you shouldn't be stopping those things because that's that's how they exist they do fight very often yeah yeah, absolutely. That's such a good point is, um, you know, we may see things that we don't like, or we want to intervene, but that's, you know, that's nature. Nature, you know, doesn't care one way or another. It just does its thing. So they're used to that competition. All right. We have a great group of classrooms joining us live via camera today. Uh, and so we're going to start meeting some of them now. So we're going to head to Ontario. Uh, Chalk River, we've got some grades six, seven, eights hanging out with us. Let me bring them, Mr. Shattuck's crew, into the call. How are we doing today, boys and girls? Hey, boys and girls. Hi. I would like to know if you know why the hummingbird's wings flap so fast. That's a great question. Um, um, sorry, I'm echoing a little bit. I um, haven't studied hummingbird flight myself, but um, from... Sorry, let me just close this the screen that I have open. Um, hummingbird wings, so they're really small. And the smaller that hummingbirds get, the more they have to flap their wings. So it's about how, how big your wings are and how big your body is. And the smaller hummingbirds have even smaller wings compared 
to their body, I think. And so they have to flap them even faster to stay uh, um, to stay in the air. Um, if they don't flap fast enough, then they would fall to the ground. Um, and it's more striking for hummingbirds because they hover and to feed. There are the flowers that they feed on are really delicate, and they would fall off if they sat on them. So hummingbirds have to hover to stay in the air to be able to feed from flowers. And to do that, they have to flap really, really, really fast. If you're moving forward um, and flying like this, it's a lot less flaps per minute. But when you're hovering in one place, um, you have it's like it's like pedaling on a on a bike. Does that make sense? Maybe not. You don't have to pedal to stay in the same place. Okay, never mind. Just imagine you were you were trying to fly to stay in the same place. You'd have to fly really fast or beat your wings really fast to stay in the same place, mainly because they have to hover. All right, good question. Uh, we have a group, they're joining us in the call, but uh, we don't have their camera. Fourth graders in uh, Benicia, California with Mrs. Leong, and they sent us in a, a great question here. Let me just bring it up. So Dylan uh, in California, he wants to know, is it easy to tell the difference between a male or a female hummingbird? It really, it really depends on the species. Um, so you'd have to look up based on where you are from California, right? So there's a lot of different species in California. There's Anna's hummingbirds and Allen's hummingbirds. Um, so you'd have to look up which species you see. Usually, I think the ones that you would get, the males would have a bright throat patch and the females would not. The females are more dull colored um, and more white and brownish kind of colors. Um, and so the juveniles would also be, or the young ones would also be like the females, even if they are males. Is made with simple, natural ingredients. So um, the male, the males usually have the, the brighter throats and are, are more colorful in general than the females. But some species they look the same. It depends. All right, excellent. Uh, let's see. We've got a few coming in via the YouTube chat, so let's pick one over here. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, Ms. Childress is tuning in and they have uh, two questions. One, Libby wants to know, what is your favorite species of hummingbird? And the second one is they have a nature preserve in their town and they do a hummingbird count each year. So they're wondering how those counts are helpful to a conservationist. Great questions. Um... My favorite hummingbird is the is the booted racket tail that I showed earlier with the little boots on his legs. Um, mainly, I think because I saw one of them, the males displaying to a female for in a mating ritual, and it was just it was just amazing to to be in the middle of a forest in Ecuador and watch these tiny little birds flying at each other. Um, but they're also just really adorable. Um, how do counts help conservationists? So there's so much. Well, nowadays, more and more, it's it's in the context of humans and human existence. Um, and there's so much that we're doing to affect our environment. We build buildings everywhere. We kick animals out of their homes. Um, so often before and after a development project, they need to do an environmental assessment of the area and see which animals are still alive now and then which animals are still living in that place after the development. Um, and so we can know what we can do to conserve them or if their numbers are getting low, for example. In the nature preserve, uh, it's just nice, I'm sure, to have numbers of animals over time and see what um, environmental variables, for instance, are affecting them. Uh, like how uh, is the weather affecting the abundance of hummingbirds in different years? Um, there's there's just it's actually it's endless the number of questions you could ask you could compare the number of hummingbirds in this preserve to another number of hummingbirds in a different preserve you could compare the number of hummingbirds in the preserve versus in a city or um somewhere else there's just i don't know come up with questions is probably what conservation conservationists are thinking yeah so lots of good data it's not just for the sake of counting but you could, there's a lot of different ways you can use that data exactly all right very cool uh, Miss Michael's group, fourth graders in Glenview, Illinois, joining us virtually. Let's bring Miss Michael in. Hey, Miss Michael. Hi. I'm going to see if my student Monse um, can ask her question. Monse, unmute and see if we can hear you. Um. Um. Why do you study the hummingbirds pee? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I. 
okay so there's one way to study how much energy hummingbirds use in 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 a day in 24 hours and that's by feeding them or injecting them a little bit with uh, a form of water or an isotope double isotope of water um so basically that isotope we can analyze the amount of that isotope in their pee um and we can see we can collect the pee on the first day let them go and do their own thing and then collect them the second day collect another pee sample and see the difference in the isotope levels in the pee on the two days and that tells us how much energy they've used so basically collecting hummingbird pee was a way for me to get data on their energy without without harming them or or you know killing them or doing anything bad to them um and so i got really really excited when hummingbirds peed because it would give me information on how much how much energy they used in a day and it was a, it was an alternative to the fitbit method because we couldn't put fitbits on them to see how much energy they used in 24 hours i got really excited when hummingbirds peed Uh, fair enough. We know explorers who get excited when bl uh, blue whales poop. So there's lots of good information you can get from uh, collecting what they leave behind. Okay, before we jump to our next classroom, I'm going to take a temporary detour here just for fun because I can. And I'm going to give us a hummingbird moment. This is a live studio or live cam from California of hummingbirds uh, at a feeder. So this would be cool That's to have awesome. in your classroom. If you were, you know, just quietly working, you could have this live and you can see there's a whole crew here taking advantage of these feeders from this live cam. Those might be Anna's hummingbirds. Yeah, I bet, being in California, very cool. So there we go, our hummingbird moment. Let's pop back and grab uh, some more questions. Uh, where do we need to go now? Let us visit Mrs. McIntosh. Her crew is in Brampton. Looks like some grade five and six. They are virtual with us today. And there we go. Hey, Miss McIntosh. Hey there. Um, Sarah, do you want to ask your question? Sorry, I'm asking online. Sarah, do you want to ask? Okay, I'll ask for her. Sarah wants to know what inspires you in your studies to pursue, you know, learning about these animals. There's, there's so many ways to answer that, but um, I think I love asking questions and then going out and finding the answers. And it's really hard sometimes because earlier on you can like look in a book and find the answer, but I'm finding answers sometimes to questions that that don't have answers yet. Um, and so often I fail and it goes something goes wrong or I have something is not what I expected and I have to do it all over again. Um, so there's a lot of rejection in it, but there's also so much discovery and there's so much wonder and knowing how something works is somehow even more amazing than just like seeing something and being amazed by it. So um, I think it's it's just asking questions and then being able to find the answers is pretty incredible. All right, spoken like a good scientist going out with questions into the field, go out with 10 questions, probably come back with 100. That's yeah, just exactly. Way. It yeah. just gives you more questions, actually. All right, very cool. Uh, where are we going now? Mr. Garcia's group, they are in London, Ontario, some sixth graders. I'm gonna pop in Mr. Garcia. How are we doing, sir? Good. Um, Kingston has a question, mainly that uh, he's wondering if hummingbirds are ever kept as pets and are there problems with people trying to capture hummingbirds and selling them with uh, the illegal pet trade? That is a problem. Um, you are not supposed to keep hummingbirds as pets, um, mainly because I think uh, many decades ago, people used to smuggle them uh, to Europe and keep them as pets and they don't do well as pets. Um, a lot of them end up dying. They can't survive the journey very well. But even locally, um, it's it, all hummingbirds are protected under what's called the CITES or the, it's like a, it's an act for endangered species. And all hummingbirds are under that act. Um, even if they're abundant, even if there's lots of them of that species, they're still protected. So you shouldn't keep hummingbirds as pets. Um, the only situation when people can keep hummingbirds indoors is um, scientists who have to go through a lot of permitting to get to get to do that. And uh, there's a lot of there's a committee that makes sure that they're doing things uh, legally and ethically and, you know, considerately for the hummingbirds. 
Um, and the other situation is wildlife rehabilitation people um, who take injured hummingbirds and keep and keep them for a while to get them well and then let them go again. So those are the only situations that I know of where you can keep keep a hummingbird. All right, I think. That is a problem with us humans is we see something exotic or exciting or beautiful and we want to have it. But, you know, like you said, when you head out into the field, that's the excitement of it is seeing it out in the field in its natural environment is much better, I think. For sure. Bigger accomplishment. All right. Um, let's bring in our next group. We've got Miss McRae's fifth graders joining us virtually. They're in London, Ontario as well. Let me pop... Uh, Madame McCray in. How are we doing today? Good, thanks. Um, Ecom in my class wanted to know how long hummingbirds live. Yeah, good question. People have put little aluminum bands on hummingbirds with uh, unique numbers on them to uh, and and trap them at sites uh, every year, for example, to see when the same ones come back um, and how long they come back for. And the longest ever, I think it was tw a 12 year old hummingbird. Um, but the average age for a hummingbird is about seven years. Average lifetime is about seven years. All right. Uh, let's scan the YouTube. We've got a few questions coming in here. Let's see. Oh, okay. Uh, Miss Legrand is tuning in, and their class is wondering about food coloring in the in the feeders. Yes. No. And is it true? I think they've heard that the egg it can it can affect their eggshells. I don't know about the eggshells. It's very possible, um, but no food coloring in the feeders for sure. There's no need for it, um, and food coloring is usually made and tested for humans. So we don't really know all of the effects that it can have on hummingbirds, but it they might be bad. And uh, wildlife rehabilitators have found that it it doesn't uh, help them at all. Like it harms, it can harm them. So the feeders are red enough. You usually get really red feeders. And if you're feeding hummingbirds, just put sugar and water in there. It shouldn't have anything else in it. Preferably boiled water. Yeah. Yeah, we put up our feeder for the first time. Uh, we changed it uh, almost daily. Um, and yeah, we left the food coloring out. But the feeder itself, you know, had some nice red on it and, you know, colors. and. It took about a week or two, but once they found it, they were steady every day. Exactly, yeah. Them. They'll find it. They look for red stuff all the time. They'll find it without the food coloring. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, let's start swinging through some live classrooms again, see if they have some follow-up for us. So, Mr. Shaddock's crew, I see someone waiting. Hello. I wanted to know how many hummingbirds there were, how many species of them. There's over 330 different species, and there's many, many, many individuals in each species. And I bet because a lot of them are found, you know, rainforest tropical areas, there's probably more uh, for us to find. One was discovered a couple of years ago, a new one um, in the highlands in Ecuador. Very cool. Yeah. Okay, uh, Miss Michaels crew, let's bring you back in. Hi, I have a question from Emma. Emma, if you want to unmute, you were, wanted to ask about predators. Okay, so um, what predators prey on hummingbirds? Yeah, um, it's hard to, to quantify it, to like give put a number to it, but I think uh, very commonly snakes and owls and birds of prey like raptors, um, like hawks. Um, can feed on hummingbirds. I've seen videos of a praying mantis at a feeder catching a hummingbird as well, so that there might be some insects that are able to eat hummingbirds as well. But the main ones are the, are the bigger birds, um, birds of prey and um, snakes. Yeah, I saw that same video as well. Um, yeah, praying mantis is definitely one of my favorite insects and they're, they are stealthy, good hunters. Uh, let's see. Devin is tuning in via YouTube with his class and is curious. Uh, you know, we mentioned earlier that they do fight for resources. Do they generally, you know, one chases the other one off, or can it get, can they actually hurt uh, each other? They can hurt each other. Uh, a lab, a person, another person in my lab 
saw a hummingbird poke another one's eyes out and then he's seen ones which don't like have are blind in one eye um they sometimes peck and like pull at each other's feathers so they can definitely inflict damage okay fair enough i mean there's there's lots we don't see right we see the the beautiful you know eating from the nectar zipping around but it's a it's a hard life you especially when resources are um limited all right so mr garcia's crew do you guys have another question for us uh yes i have several students that are wondering about sort of the history of hummingbirds like how long have they existed for and like were they around during the the time of the dinosaurs did what did they evolve from great question um it's not completely certain their entire evolutionary history is, is very hard to tell because their fossils don't preserve very well um, of the hummingbird ancestors because they're such tiny bones and their feathers don't preserve very well so it's hard to know but um the current you know, understanding from scientists is that the hummingbird ancestors were something like swifts or swallows, which are a different group of birds that were in Europe. They found a fossil that looks a lot like a hummingbird ancestor. And about that was about 20 million years ago. They moved over to North America and then came down to South America and then just speciated or diversified. There's just so many species started um, evolving. And then they moved back up into North America. They got went extinct in North America and then came back up from South America um, and diversified into North America. So that's the current understanding of, of hummingbird evolution. But we're, we we could always find new things and find new fossils and revise our understanding of humming, hummingbird evolution. All right, great question. Uh, where should we go? Madame McRae, do you have another question from your crew? I was just wondering what happens to the hummingbirds during the cold Canadian winters. Yeah, so a lot of them, it depends on where you are. If you're on the East Coast, they for sure go migrate back down to Central and South America, um, the ruby-throated hummingbirds. If you're on the West Coast, there might be some Anna's hummingbirds that are resident year round, depending on where in Canada you are. Um, but most of them come up just for the summer to breed and then go back down to Central and South America for the winter. Um, so they have separate wintering grounds and separate breeding grounds. All right. And I was surprised, uh, <laughs> with my kids, we, we very much got into hummingbirds this summer as we were setting up the feeder and learning and trying to figure out how long we should keep it out for. And I was surprised at, at how long they could still be making an appearance as they're making their way south, even as the temperature drops, you know, fairly significantly, it's still kind of worth keeping it out just in case there's some stragglers. Like in September? Right. What did you find in September or October or how late? Yeah, we had them into September. Um, we took it down after that, but, you know, some reading as well, uh, you know, said they could even be a little bit slower, some of them. Pretty yeah, cool. especially with feeders, I think there's a northward expansion on the west coast of the Annas especially, and they're able to stay longer and longer year round, um, partly because of feeders and maybe partly because of temperatures warming on average. Yep. Uh, Miss McIntosh's group, let's bring you in. We're going to try again. Reedy, do you want to go for it, kiddo? Reedy? No? Okay, I will ask. She wants to know. What, what do male hummingbirds do their whole life? Because females have the job of making more generations, but what do males do? They exist, um, they feed, <laughs> and they mate with the females. Um, they're also in general you'll see them being more aggressive at feeders so they have more territories and so maybe so it depends on the species but some of the males might sit in one place and defend a territory and then females come and visit those territories to find the male that they want to mate with um, there's other species which do what's called lecking where one male um, is the primary male in it in in an area and the other males kind of help that male find a mate by calling or displaying or doing doing something to attract the females. Um, so it depends on the species, but they they exist and they they do stuff and they have babies with the females. All right, calling out those slacker male hummingbirds. Um, so that that did answer a question. Manisha was wondering online whether they did cooperatively breed like some other bird species. So 
Very cool. We were able to Most of them don't. Most of them don't. It's very few out of the 330 something species that, that do the cooperative breeding. Yeah. So uh, another question uh, from YouTube. So knowing that sometimes, you know, with so many different species, they might have different niches. Are they all nectar feeders or there, is there any species of hummingbird that might have a different strategy? All of them feed on nectar, as far as we know. Um, there's so much we don't know. But I think the amount of insects in their diet versus nectar is really unknown. People are starting to look at this for a couple of species in the US, but the South American hummingbirds, we have no idea, um, like the relative amount of insects and, and, and uh, nectar in their diet. All right, very cool. And I think that's an important take home is um, sometimes I think students think we, we've discovered everything, we've explored everything, but there's so many questions, uh, especially in biology that we still need to have answered. We're discovering new species all the time. I think we've got something in the neighborhood of 1.3 million species identified and it could be as high as eight to 10 million species on earth. So. Uh, there's a lot left to be done in biology and a lot of questions to answer. There is. All right. So uh, as we're wrapping up, uh, Anusha, I'd love to ask you. Uh, oh, never mind. I want to squeeze in our California class. They just sent in a question for us uh, via the chat. Matthew wants to know, uh, do you know if there's what the rarest type of hummingbird is? Is there one that's maybe highly endangered or not seen often? I don't know if I can say what the rarest is. I know there's a lot of rare ones, which are what are called endemics, where they're only found in one small little place. And so by definition, they're rare. Um, I think one of the rarest ones is the the newest discovered one, um, which is one of the, it, it's a hill star species, which is a type a group of hummingbirds. Um, and because it's so rare, it was only discovered recently. So it was very hard to find earlier. Um, and it's only present in one very specific type of habitat in the highlands in Ecuador. All right. Well, Anusha, with our theme for the month, you know, celebrating women in science and exploration, is there someone who inspired you? Somebody who, you know, you saw their work or their explorations, their adventures, and they inspired you growing up? I think it was never famous people because they were just like other people who did their own thing. But I think my mom um, and some of my science teachers in school were definitely some of the most inspirational people um, who encouraged my my love of biology. Like my mom was totally okay with me raising insects in the house. And she's kind of creeped out by a lot of the things that I love, like snakes and lizards and stuff, but she never stopped me from wanting to study them. And I had a, a science teacher in like the third grade, I think, Mrs. Long, who ha had us um, feed iguanas and, and other stuff. Like she had a bunch of animals in the classroom and we we um, tried to make a cloud in the classroom by using humidifiers, which didn't work, but it was just such a great environment to be science-y in. And so I think you all, your teachers and the parents have such a huge role in, in keeping curiosity alive in your students and children. All right, very cool, good choices. Um, you know, it's, it's cool to see the people who are on TV and, and, and writing books, but sometimes those closest to home, uh, can have the biggest influence and, and be real drivers in, in what you're doing. Uh, all right. Well, huge shout out to everyone tuning in on YouTube. Thanks for sending in those great questions today. Uh, a big shout out to our camera classrooms. Let me just pop them in for a second so they can just give away. Give away. A mixture of virtual. Oh, there's another crew on their iPads. Very cool. Good to see everybody. I can't see you guys. Thank you. Yes. Can hear them. Very cool. Uh, Anusha, and a huge thank you to you. Thank you for giving us some time. Thank you for sharing your excitement for biodiversity, uh, especially the hummingbird species that you do study. And uh, we look forward to hosting you again and maybe one day from the field, which would be a ton of fun. Yeah, maybe the summer. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Joe. Thank you all for coming. Day. We'll see you soon.